Finding Defects with the New South Wales Building Commissioner. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee because we're going to have a look at a video shared by David Chandler, the New South Wales Building Commissioner, as he started going on site for, well, to conduct a inspections and have a look at some of the issues that are occurring in New South Wales now that he has the power to go onto buildings to be called onto buildings. So let's have a look at this video and then some of the comments that people have made about it. I will just bring this up here and make sure the audio can play. And out in the field on the 1st of July in New South Wales and we've now got a situation where we've got low head height in a fire stair. Now that's a problem in itself because if you're more than six foot two, you're going to struggle here. But if you're the structural engineer, what are you doing here? What's happening here from a structural engineering point of view? You got some exposed rear, that's for sure. Designers have to design a project properly and engineers have to make sure that when they certify projects, that the structure is up to the design that's been provided. This is simply unacceptable. And he forgot one thing. The builders have to build it like you design it. The subbies have to actually look at the drawings. So it's not just the designer's fault, everyone. It's ludicrous to even imply that. It either shows he's politically motivated or he's got a lack of understanding of what the actual problem is in the industry. There's a whole lot going on. And this is, I mean, this is the type of person you want out there going and inspecting these buildings. You know, you'd normally want him working, working for the builder to find any defects, but, but when it gets to this point, this is a nightmare, okay? And this happens. This happens where people, you know, this is a big stuff up. This is a, a clearance issue, everyone. This is a, a critical, this is a potential life safety issue if people are running out of that fire escape and a tall person whacks their head on it, passes out, and then you get people all, uh, well, jamming it up and dying. So it's not an insignificant thing. Now let's have a look at some of the comments that people have left there uh, because I think that gives a bit of insight into what's going on here. Because I've, I mean, here's the thing. What's going to manifest here is there's going to be exposed Rio, exposed steel, and there could be issues. It could be the builder didn't build it right. It could be the architect didn't draw it right. It could be the coordination wasn't checked. It could be there was a change that happened Later in the project, because maybe the you know an agent made a, uh, a third party made a change to the design and these type of things, and that that's manifested through this. There are a lot of unknowns, and it comes down to one of really one of the biggest issues is documentation, thorough documentation. Now, when we started our practice, we really invested heavily in uh, aiming to have high quality, thorough documentation where we coordinated. We spent about $50,000 buying all of these different softwares and programs so we could coordinate. We'd get, we were using 3D uh, modeling, 3D coordination, and collision detection on all of our projects. We'd get the, the modeling from the mechanical engineer. We'd get the modeling from the structural engineer. And as the architect, we would bring it all together to make sure there were no issues. No, and we had all the clearances. And that was particularly a problem, well, a challenge with a lot of the Mining work we did. We did volumetric mining work, and they had to keep these buildings uh, within truck transportation heights because it had a cost implication. Even some of the tunnels on the mines that you had to go through or get access to drive up there were things that we needed to take into account. So we invested a lot of time, a lot of money. We had a rigorous process where every drawing was checked three times and stamped by three people, including at least one director, before it left the office. We had all this technology that we invested in. Now... Do you think that made a difference? Do you think that made a difference long term? Uh, what if the builder just ignored it? What if they didn't appreciate it? Did it lead to more work? Yeah. They're not going to talk to each other. They don't care. The architects are a dime a dozen. It comes down to price. So you can be putting a fee in for certain work, particularly if it's design and construct, and it'll come down to the price. That's what it'll come down to. Recently, the last quote I did for the government and I, I, I don't know if I even bothered anymore putting them in now. At this point in my career, you know, we've been in business for 10 years. Uh, we've completely scaled back. I, I've, I can't be bothered hiring people directly. We had up to what, 
10 people at one stage, an insane number. And now I'd rather just do a few beautiful projects a year and that's enough to keep me happy and I'm making more money and more money is actually winding up in my pocket now than when I had a bit of bigger operation. I had to manage all these people and chase all this work just to keep the machine going. Now, the thing is, if you're, as the architect, if you're not rewarded for providing this quality of service, you know, are, you, are people going to be incentivized to price it in? So this last government job that I priced in for, you know, I, I did the sums. I looked at it, how much I'd have to do. And this would be me taking, as the lead consultant, full responsibility for everyone else's work as the architect. I'd have to coordinate everyone else's work. Multi-million dollar job. I could probably charge 100 grand for it if I was lucky. And that barely would cover my costs, let alone a profit. And I'm taking the risks for everyone else underneath me, all the engineers. So in this circumstance here, if the engineer were to make a stuff up on this, as the architect, you're dragged in on this issue, guys. You're dragged in on the lawsuit, even if it was completely had nothing to do with you. Your insurance company, your PI will be dragged in. You, you know, if it's, it was a sub, if it was someone else, it was a set out issue, it was a survey issue, you'll all be dragged in. Then you'll have to deal with that stress. You'll have to deal with those issues. You know, we have unregulated free we have fees. We have a free market. So there's a challenge here to manage it. You've got to get to the point where you have enough income to walk away from these clients and these jobs. So let's have a look what David has written here and then go through some of the comments. So out on the field yesterday on day one of the DBP Act, what we saw was simply unacceptable. Over the next five days, we will upload five videos showing common issues we've seen on sites across the five building elements. In today's video, we have a message for engineers, structural engineers, and designers working on the building structure. We're getting the message out. You, may, uh, you might remember this clip from the Channel 7 News last night. Um, this is not a surprise, guys. Under the Design and Building Practitioners Act, designers will now be providing completely declared designs and builders will need to declare that is what they have built. Yeah, that's the thing. You can design it. But if they don't build it like that, it doesn't matter what you design. I've had that happen. I had a, a job we were engaged for to do, to literally go out there on site, check and observe. Money ran out, so they fired us for that component. Then I got the builder sending me, this, oh, just sign this paperwork. Just sign this letter confirming that what we've done is accurate. I'm going to go to hell. I'm not going, I didn't see one method of the construction. I can't sign that. This is, this is what happens, guys. It's, I think uh, the biggest issue here is the procurement method that's used in these buildings, design and construct, where the certifier and the architect are working under the builder. And we, we can't ensure what is done. There's no, no Clarker works anymore on the site. The DPB does not just signal a change for the professions. It's a change for all practitioners and tradespeople. All trades on site need to take responsibility for delivering compliant work. It's time for you to be professional, to follow Australian standards, and only do work you would be proud of. Don't let your work end up. <laughs> don't let your work end up in one of my videos. I think he's gonna he's gonna be pretty busy going around. So the, I've asked a question here. You know, how is it procured? I want to see if design and construct is leading to more of these type of issues and corner cutting than otherwise. Uh, because, well, frankly, this, frankly, the the banks are demanding it in many ways. They're, only, they're, they're the ones who are funding particular projects, and they have the real power. We don't need, well, you don't need a building commissioner if the banks will restrict fundings to projects depending on the contract. They need to feel the pain for all this. But anyway, let's have a look at some of the comments. Mark Montgomery, a director from Brickclad. So, David, do you look at the drawings and see what the RL Heights was meant to be, and if it's wrong with the architects? If the area started in the car park, that means you have issues in other places. Were, were surveyors doing the set-out? You should post where the issue started and why uh, it was missed at time of construction. So, Mark, the answer is we will. This call was on an anywhere, anytime visit. A full audit will follow and a, a prohibition order as well. There will be many e exhibits from this project, which we now dub Nightmare on Condamine Street. Your regular posts seem to infer we missed this stuff. Designers need to know that we will be visiting their offices to see how these incompetent incompetencies may have occurred watch this space there you go so they're going to start visiting your offices as designers i mean there you go that's another level of risk another issue do you even want to be a practitioner in new south wales anymore 
you want to take the risk of doing the work. You're just going to have to factor it into your fees, guys. And, you know, I've got a small operation, low cost, and I'll lose to big practices that offshore all the work or charge. I don't know how they can get their fees that low. I don't know how they can get their fees that low on some jobs. When we were doing all the Lorna Jane stuff, the fees, because we saw what the competitors were charging, the fees that they were charging is a joke. I think they were just doing it just to retain that sector you know, for their brand. So they were pretty much running at a loss or at cost. It's insane. And the issue is you've got rampant um, well, unpaid overtime in our industry as well, particularly with the interior designers. So there's a lot of problems in the design professions, guys. It, frankly, it's just not worth it for a lot of people. Mark Montgomery, actually, that is a really good point. Point tradies will often pick up an error early, but for the cost and time issue, not to be able to action a fix. Surprised there are not calls from the uh, naturally lobotomized that this is a pure building certifier fault. Uh, well, I mean, that. see, this is the thing. You've got a whole lot of people blaming the certifiers. It's just because they don't understand the industry, okay? The, the, it's not the certifier's responsibility. And honestly, we're going to see more and more of these type of defects, guys. You know, I was talking, there was a, a builder we were working for, and I, I heard, you know, they'd worked on an, a multi story building. And these are the type of things. This you should catch. The architect should catch where one thing we did, you know, another cost, we used to do compliance drawings. So every, every plan, floor plan, we would, we would overlay all of the Australian standard required clearances, and we'll include that in our set. You know, I'd never seen other architects doing that. I think they're just starting to now. But we'd do this as a set. We'd issue it to the certifier to show, you know, we meet these clearances. Here, that should be a section through the stair where you've got a clearance showing you nose to head. You should be able to check that. You should be able to import the structural engineer's model, link it up with yours. But the problem is we had a job where, you know, I'd put a fee proposal together. I'd listed all these requirements. And then, you know, they, they gave me an engineer that couldn't bloody well draw for crap, was drawing 2D rubbish, so it was a nightmare to coordinate, and all these costs were added in. So can you go back to them for fees when the job is halfway you know, done and you're just getting all this rubbish information when you've had three project managers that have all changed? That's kind of, you can see why I'm, I'm not chasing the multi-res stuff, guys. I just can't be bothered playing in this field. It's just there's no money in it, and there's a lot of stress in it too, just so you can get you know a, a box in the sky that looks like everyone else's. Maybe I'm getting too cynical for the game, guys. Um, so, Bob, if designers were forced to do properly documented designs, then I wonder if the debate on minimum scales of professional fees would rear its head after decades of hibernation. Yeah, fees are, fees are shit, guys. Architects don't make much money in fees. For, you've got you've to gotta understand, for the amount of risk that we take on, the risk-to-reward ratio, it's insane. Even if you get good fees, you're still fighting people for money. I built into my database a bloody system to chase fees. You know, I made a comment, um, what was it? Uh, you know, a comment on Twitter about, you know, YouTube is still less stressful chasing, you know, I've never had to chase YouTube for fees. Sure, they can delete my whole channel and that revenue stream disappears, but it's less stressful than, than you know, waiting on 80, 100 grand that you've already spent to do a big portion of a job and people are just stringing you on. It's there's, it's not fun. It is not fun. Can you tell why I've, I'm much happier now, smaller scale? Because yeah, fees are in the gutter, guys. That's what it is. It's no co coincidence the banning of the MSOPF um, preceded the drop off in design and comprehensive documentation standards, which plummeted to the bottom and have contributed significantly to many of the problems the New South Wales Co Building Commission has just started exposing. It's been dodgy city so to speak, for way too long, and now there is a new sheriff in town. Well, yeah, that's it. We've got more previous replies. Nailed it. Fees need to be brought under control so firms can put forward competitive quotes that still account for a fully documented design process. Right now, it's difficult to put forward a realistic fee if you want to compete with those going under on the fee and quality of service provided. I'm not quite sure how or who this can be administered by, especially in private tenders where it is difficult to audit impartially, but it's, it's definitely an issue that is getting worse each year from my vantage point. Bruce is saying a minimum standard of documentation is a better call. I, I think it needs to come from the banks. 
I think the pressure needs to be put on the banks to finance. They need to feel the pain and the sting of this type of rubbish happening. Forget the developers. Forget a building commissioner. Make the banks liable for dodgy projects. You know, The people who are funding these projects, make them liable. Then you'll start to see some bloody standards put in place. You don't, you know, it's he who holds the money who has the control, everyone. Everything else is just theater. It's, it, you know, the, he'll be running around like this forever. It's not going to change. Or maybe it will, but st- it's going to take a long time. You want fast action? You get the people who have the money, give that, you know, make them have the power. It used to be the banks that had standards. I can't believe I'm advocating for the banks. They used to have standards for house construction. You couldn't get a, a home loan unless it, it met their requirements. So, um, Bruce Robb, uh, minimum standard in Australia as a self-regulation concept has failed dismally, which is what the New South Wales Building Commissioner is in the process of exposing and enforcing. Who, would, uh, who and how would minimum documentation standards be enforced? Also, design is a creative process, which would be difficult to write standards for. On the other hand, it's a, uh, documentation is a technical process for which minimum standards could and should be written. Well, they have. They have. You've got them. Um, I mean, here's the thing. It's we'll keep going down. Here's the issue: you, if you can, you document to mitigate your risk as a designer. You've got to document appropriately. But it's frustrating when you you know you talk to a builder and they just ignore what you do, ignore what you do, refuse to do it, and do it themselves. But you're designing constructs, so you're working under them. You raise a stink, you lose a client. That's why it's, it's novel finding uh, good people to work with. So awesome work, David Chandler. Remember when you said if the builder can't afford a cleaner, imagine how they would be cutting costs on the concrete structure. You need to check the liquid waste issue. For too many builders, uh, far too many builders use 44 gallon washout drums and typically end up polluting our environment, sometimes straight into our waterways and oceans, and sometimes even straight into the sewer. We all know that sewer doesn't clean the construction liquid waste. Again, great to see you out on site. If you have time, please check out where builders make us clean our tools. It's typically disgusting. Uh, Not that I'm in any way condoning this particular example, but if the engineer is happy for some concrete to be removed and the height achieves the required two meters, surely there there is no longer an issue. All the, de- the design detail in the world, unfortunately, won't get rid of all these issues, but a pragmatic approach to a suitable solution is still achievable. Now, that's a good point there. That's a good point. It looks dramatic. What if the engineer is happy with it? What if you put a protective compound to ensure that there's no issue in, the, uh, you know, in moisture getting into the concrete? What if you seal it up? What if there's, a, you, know, they, they, you know, it's just temporary, Remember, if it's a building under construction, it's just a work in progress, and they find a solution. Remember, these things are over-engineered. They over-engineer them to the moon. And you'll have engineers are arguing with each other over what is the best solution. I've had this happen on jobs, and people have used it as a way to, um, you know, to push one engineer out and get another one. Yeah, it can happen too, guys. Um, great stuff. It's about time proper building inspections took place. Brilliant. Mate, you'll be banned from site in no time. I hate it when PMs and consultant teams rush through to close out items in sequence without checking if any of the followings, following items require opening uh, some, presi- some precisely closed items. Well, because nature of design is iterative, not a linear process. The problem is opening things up. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. If, if you come... Traditionally, the architect will be the independent party between the, the person procuring the building and the contractor. You'll be the one in the middle, and you'll be the one inspecting and approving, and you'd have your consultants there doing it. But it's, it's just a mess. Unbelievable. Well, no, it's definitely believable. Uh, simply unacceptable, all too common. Yep. Architects, as the main consultants, have to check compliance with these items. Head height with the building code. Yeah, he's right. And there is always a cheaper consultancy who is happy to take over and probably compromise. See, this is the thing. It's an easy check. There, there would be sections done through the drawing that would indicate that. So what could have happened is it could have been a coordination issue between the architectural and the structural drawings that resulted in this. Or it was designed to have maybe a chamfer at the edge and it wasn't picked up by the tradie. There could be a whole lot of issues there that could be going on. You know. 
So um, he here totally agree. Hammer away, David. The industry will either bend to the rules or break and leave. Two words, design and construct. Oh, here we go. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. Commonly, re commonly refers to builders ignoring architects' plans and specifications so they can lessen the cost of the build in both materials and design elements. Yep, 100%. That, that's what happens. You can do all this work, all this work, and they can just ignore it. <laughs> they can just ignore it, guys. Here's the thing. So they'll say architecturally designed and just ignore it. It's just marketing. Cannot blame the builder sometimes as he is competing against other builders with developers reaping the cost savings. This is nothing new to see or read about. Nothing new, uh, John to people in the game, people in the industry. We're all familiar with it. You know, you, you talk, you go to a networking event, you talk to other people, and they'll all be able to relate to this. Sometimes design and construct can work out fantastically if you've got a, you know, a good builder or a builder that's interested in their brand more than anything. You know, I've seen it on some jobs. Right now we're working on some jobs where we're working with a builder that tends to respect the process. But... You know, it depends. So, including on government-funded projects. Yes, yeah, yes, yep. Trying to cut corners on pricing, but expecting no corners to be cut by anyone else. It's ironic because New South Wales government is as guilty of this as anyone. Yeah, no, they're right. That's right. Love it. This week I walked onto a job. I'm a PM across the line. The chippy's about to start installing uh, PMDFs to the escape stairs. The door swings the wrong way on the drawings. Stop, do not install. Asked architect if it's correct. Yes, really. The fire engineers say it's correct. Yes, I ring the building server. Did, the, did you stamp the drawings? Yes. Are these doors the wrong way? Yes. I just saved $3,000 because three professionals didn't look. Happens too often. There you go. That's, that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. Let's have a look at some of the previous replies. Um, hi, Doug. Great calling around, but I have problems with this. Are you telling me you instructed to hang the doors the wrong way when you know it's the wrong way based on what others have incorrectly advised or signed off, or have I misunderstood your message? I don't understand this, Doug. Could you kindly elaborate, please? You're implying three qualified building professionals made this mistake, uh, and they admitted. Uh, we'll have to see. Hang on. The door swings the wrong way on the drawings. Okay, so did you put it in the right way? I'd watch this TV series. Sign me up. I think it'd get pretty depressing. Uh, Gavin, uh, seeing this on fire stairs, I've been in around Sydney for a few times now. Might be a chain of consequences on the back of constrained floor to floors. There's always pressure to squeeze an extra floor in. But these sorts of things are essential to test in the design. The structural outcome on the edge is definitely concerning also. This emphasizes the importance of 3D BIM modeling. Yes, 100%. It is so much easier to coordinate information from a range of consultants if you bring it in 3D. I'm at the point now where I can't, I, I can't even bother working in 2D. It's, it's frustrating working. I, I, I have not done a 2D drawing since I was a student. As a method to check the spatial impacts of decisions like this, some firms have developed clash routines to check for exactly this issue on all their fire stairs, but not all of them are as diligent in their QA, I think. Good to see it being called out. I mean, all it is is a section and a, a, two lines. That's all you need to do to check this. It's not that big. It should be standard on your stair drawings. You should have stair drawings in every set. You should have two lines there to check it. That's it. Problem. We don't know how this job was coordinated. We don't know how it was managed. We don't know if the people were even paid for coordination. You've got some PMs that will say, no, they'll coordinate it. Interesting to read of a clash routine to test this, Gavin. Uh, you don't need a clash routine. Here, anyway, let, let's have a look at what, what he's looking here. Oh, this is... um. Okay, I can't find it there. He's using Rivet. Uh, Rhino, inside for these days. It's faster. Uh, I mean, okay, th this is getting into into uh, documentation nerd nerd fantasy. Why the hell are people putting their their um, 
pronouns in their LinkedIn. Oh, come on. Guys, grow up. Seriously. Oh, bloody hell. Link- LinkedIn's becoming woke, guys. It is. Sorry that we have to go through this. Uh, can't, can't wait for the video focusing on fire doors. Yeah. The old architects versus structural plans problem. Builder developers need in-house design managers to bring together their consultants' work to ensure an e- economic, quick, compliant building. Now, that's that's one role that's developing where builders are hiring design managers to work for them to coordinate this rather than paying the consultants to do it properly. It, you know, and then they have complete control over the design manager. Easier said than done. I think too many builders... Uh, I think too many builders and or clients rely on their consultants to solve the design issues without having someone with a builder's brain bringing it together. Good to see action to improve uh, Sydney quality. Here we go. What else? Uh, Paul, 100% surveyors have been relying, relied too greatly to pick up coordination issues between structural and architectural design. Some builders are now doing, as you said, having a design manager to be the link and pick up errors beforehand. I mean... The thing is, if you coordinate it, your design manager doesn't really have much to do. Uh, that's the thing. I didn't understand this role. When I encountered design managers, I didn't know what they were doing. Um, to be honest, on, on some of the jobs I was working on, I'm going, well, why are you here? Uh, I'm coordinating for it. I've been paid for it. So it. But then again, I can see where it can they can add value. You want someone with... You really want, in a construction job, you want the whole team to come together and sit around the table and work together to achieve an outcome. The problem is when it gets messy. The problem is when people are just siloed, where information isn't shared, you know, and that just gets frustrating. I'm a retired builder and this is totally unacceptable. I always had the engineers on site watching every con- every concrete pour. They also signed off on the structural reinforcement as well. Disgraceful, this really irks me. So there we go, guys. We've got some insight into the industry and a look at this. What are the solutions that I would suggest? Well, I wouldn't be blaming just the consultants. I think it, we need a multi-certification system. And really, people need to stop buying design and construct apartments. That, that's, that's what I'd say. Number one, stop buying design and construct apartments. Demand that you have tr- traditional procurement. It needs to come from the banks. It needs to come from the banks because this is going to go on forever, everyone. What do you reckon? If the banks start demanding a certain level, if we make the banks feel the pain for this dodginess, then it'll change. It'll change in a heartbeat. Let me know your thoughts on this one, guys. What are your experiences out there? Do you, if you're a professional, how are the fees going? You know, are you able to compete right now? Or is it still cutthroat? I've, I've, you know, I've encountered it. Anyway, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe to the channel. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one in the comments down below. If you're a fan and enjoy the content I create here, there are a few ways you can support us. You can join us on YouTube or Patreon. Support us using self-wealth or stake. Use our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or Aussie Broadband. Buy a merch from Heiser Says. Use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint or support us via PayPal. Take care. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.